Does that yeah. work? Um, it's, I love coming out here. Um, and so, um, one of the reasons we have so many people here who are doing pain and climate stuff is this is just an uh, awesome, awesome, awesome science site. So the ground beneath our feet right here is just world class in terms of what it keeps yielding for all the scientists who come out here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about reconstructing paleoclimate, which is what, not what I do. I'm a geomorphologist. So I look at surface processes, you know, how mountains fall apart and how rivers transport sediment. Um, but of course, part of what it controls that is the climate. So I'm going to talk about paleoclimate, reconstructing paleoclimate, geomorphic processes and erosion rates um, in this watershed. And of course, it's not just me who's doing the work out here. I've got a whole host of collaborators. Josh Roy, my professor, who really wanted to be here tonight, he sends his apologies. And he would like to make it out to one of the next meetings, the Save Soul Watershed meetings that's out here. Um, Dan Gavin, who's a paleoecologist who has been out pouring at Triangle Lake, and some of you have run into him one time or another. Um, and then I'm also working with a couple other people in the geography department. Sarah, whose last name, I'll find Ms. Brown, so I won't even try. But um, Sarah is another grad student and a professor, Pat Bartland. They do climate reconstructions using general circulation models, so I'll tell you a bit about that and why they'll like matter so much for that. And then T.C. Hales, who is uh, another geomorphologist, um, he's out in um, University of Cardiff in Wales, and we're working on some modeling um, that brings all this stuff together. Uh -oh. It's a whole cast of characters. Okay, so here's what I'm going to run through. Um, some of you were here last year. I recognize a few faces. Kelly, now you're going to hear the introduction three times, I think. Yes. Um, <laughs> you can do the talk for me next time. Um, so I am going to go over some of the same stuff I did last year, um, partly because not everyone was here, and that way we're all on the same page. And I know you guys don't um, spend night and day thinking about this the way I do, so um, you might want to hear it again. And then I'll talk about Little Lake and the Paleo Archive and all the really great science that's right underneath our feet. It is really cool. Um, and some of the research questions that I'm working on to frame it for you. And then I'll talk about, you know, the um, thing I just said, the watershed, the paleo climate, and geomorphic processes. We're going to try and squeeze in a little bit of crowdsourcing science. So you guys are going to help me with part of what I'm doing. And then I'm going to tell you about some really surprising results. And there's implications not just for here, but for really, really big swaths of the soil mantle landscape in the world. So as you said, Little Lake just keeps on giving. So um, last year, one of the things I was asked to talk about is how Little Lake formed, how Little Lake and Tri Lake formed. And it's actually really important to the work I'm doing. So I'm not um, telling you about this just so you know why it formed, but so you can understand why Paleo Lake, why Little Lake is such an absolutely great place to study um, history through time. So, I want to point out a couple things on the center. So this is a rotating, sorry, it's shaking the earthquake. Um, <laughs> so, um, this is a rotated Google Earth image of Little Lake and Triangle Lake watershed. So, north is this way, okay? So here's Little Lake, and here's part of Triangle Lake, and you can see the hills that are to the east. Um, you can see they have that really classic coast, um, coast range form, which is they have the really sharp ridge along the top, and then those really sharp ridges that come down, the spur ridges, right? That's just classic coast range, except when you get over here. And so when you get over there, and actually I'll just use the mouse to show you that. Um, Right in here, so here's all those classic spurs coming down, right? Scary hiking, I do a lot of field work on those spurs. Um, but here, this is an arcuate form, right? It's shaped like a cup. So that's the, the old paleo landslide. So the mountain came down, probably from a mega quake, in that area, and it blocked, this is Lake Creek here, running out to the Sayusla. So it looks something like this. <laughs> okay, this is in Taiwan. But instead of blocking a road, it would have blocked a creek. And so now I'm going to do the world's dorkiest animation. Okay, this is you're going to see the highest level of my animation skills. But this is how Paleo Lake would have formed. There's the valley, and you can see the creek running through it, right? And then the landslide comes with sound effects down from the sky in this case, and it makes a dam across the creek. Okay? And so if, if you have a landslide, 
side that dams the creek, if it's concrete enough material and enough material, it's not going to move for a really long time, right? And so the water's going to get blocked behind it. And it's just going to keep filling that valley behind it. And eventually it's going to start to fill all the tributaries on the side. And while that's happening, the hill slopes are doing their hill slope process thing, right? There's little landslides and, you know, critters are making sediment roll downhill. And it's filling up that lake basin. And so that's what Little Lake is. And so here's a GIS image of Little Lake today. And you can see the valley floor. Here's a landslide deposit right there. Here's one of our coring sites. Sorry, this is Little Lake. Here's a landslide. Here's Triangle Lake. And the remnants of this giant paleo lake. You can see these, this flat land going all the way up into the side valleys in the valley, right? So Little Lake and Triangle Lake, the valley here, has over 200 feet of sediment. And below that is where the original valley floor is. So you have 200 feet of sediment. The lands that happened 50,000 years ago, there is a continuous record of 50,000 years. It's 50, yeah. 15. 50, 5-0. 5-0. 5-0, yeah. So um, the lands, the, the, I'll show you a date soon, a, a plot soon of um, carbon-14. And um, it takes us back 50,000 years. So yes, yeah. yeah. Did you say potentially caused by an earthquake? Well, is it, is yeah, so, or? so the most likely reason, and this is a total just right. speculative, <laughs> but the most likely reason for the entire side of a mountain to come down mm -hmm. is a mega quake. Okay. There's really not too many other things that are, you know, this is all the same sandstone. And so it, it makes great ridges. I mean, you've got it, it's quite competent, despite being really weak, you know, the creek can, buy, can crush it pretty well. But yeah, so it's more, more it really can't think of anything else it would be. Okay, thanks. So, but, it's, but that's all speculation. So this is a schematic um, of exactly what I was just talking about. There's those 50,000 years of, of deposits. Right, the original valley floor is down here. And if you want, one of the things that oh, paleontologists and geomorphologists and geologists do when you're working with old deposits is one of the first things you try and do is you build a depth age model. So you can picture that if you can core down through those deposits and you can get fossils, right? And you know at what depth you're at. So I know what depth I'm at because I'm measuring it as I go. Mm -hmm. I know where the fossils are. I can get an age for the fossils. In this case, we're using carbon-14. It goes back, let's go to about 40, 45,000 years. And after that, you have to use other methods. But you can get an age for all those fossils. And then you can make a plot. And then at that point, anywhere on that line, if you know what depth you're at, you know what age you're at. OK, so that's, I actually brought some fossils from the core. I'm going to pass these around. I have one request, OK? These are, um, you'll notice that on here, there's um, writing on here. That's my identification number. It's indelible ink, but on this type of plastic, if you oil on your hands, the indelible ink will come off, and I won't be able to tell which <laughs> fossil this is. So I'm trusting you guys to hold it like this and not hold it like that. So this one is from the very, very bottom of the course. 207, it's 207 feet down. So this is wood from the paleo bottom. And it, so it's 50,000 year old wood. And you can see, this looks like something you would just pull out of your creek. This one is um, 207 again. Um, th you know, this is how wonderfully preserved this stuff is. And you guys can all pass this around. This was 124, so that's about um, 30,000 years, I guess. And I'm guessing that's about um, 23,000 years. <coughs> so, you know, this is the quality of the stuff we're pulling out of it. It makes it really easy to look at the macrofossils and figure out what it is. Whoops, let's. Just click off of it and it should work too. Yeah, we'll get there eventually. Okay, so um, I talked about this last year, but my research basically implies understanding how climate drives landscape change. So you can imagine that if it gets colder or wetter or drier or warmer, that, climate, that somehow the rate that mountains break down has to change. 
right? Well, what I'm interested in is the mechanics of how does it happen. Is there more water so you have more overland flow? <coughs> is it because you go from trees to grass and grass isn't very good at holding vegetation, holding soil in place? Is it because when you go from grass to trees, that tree roots are actually really, really good at breaking apart rock, and when they die, they um, convert a whole bunch of bedrock to soil and throw it down the hill? So I'm interested in what are the mechanics. How does changes in climate control, changes in ecosystems, and, the, and how can you use that to understand the ways that mountains um, erode and landscapes evolve, okay? So to be able to answer that question, you have to start with what a little lake <coughs> watershed look like, in my case, during the last glacial interval. So 50,000 years of time means that it goes to the non-glacial interval, so that's when it's cold and getting colder. If you can picture um, when you've seen climate charts over the years where they show all the proxy records, right? The way that goes is a sawtooth pattern. So it gets cold, 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 then it dives into the glacial, and then it bounces back out into the warm periods, like where we are now. Goes slowly, slowly, and there's, you know, excursions, occasionally get warmer, occasionally get colder, but it eventually makes it down to the really cold period, it hangs for a little bit, and then it pops back up into the warm period. And that gets repeated over and over and over again. So at 50,000 years of history under our feet here, it goes from the non-glacial interval, um, which started about 100,000 years ago, and then at 28,000 years, we started to dive into the glacial. And the actual glacial here was from 26 to 13,000 years ago, and then boom, it got warm, and the Douglas fir forest that we know today came in within 100 years. Okay, so um, I think I showed this image last time, but we've been out digging, and um, it, I'm just so grateful to the people in this watershed. So the people in the Little Lake watershed have been awesome. Um, the nobles whose property is up at the top here, we wanted to be close to the hills to get sediment coming directly down from the hills, and then down by Little Lake, the old um, Episcopal Church property, the Triangle. Lake Conference Center, now the Geese property. We've uh, taken heavy equipment several times out on the Nobles property. We've hand dug out there. Uh, we've hand poured out at the Triangle, the old Conference Center property. Um, the Newmans have been great about providing a bunch of information about when they dug wells. So all of that has been fabulous. And it's been a lot of people and a lot of labor. So this is Josh Shorty, my professor. The one standing there just looking, there's a non-geologist, Dan Gavin, the paleoecologist. He actually does quite a bit of work. We have had student interns. I have hosted um, tons of students that have come through through the community college program, and they work with me for the summer. These are people who are interested in science, but they're not necessarily getting a lot of science exposure at a community college. And I came up through the community college system, so um, I know the difference, you know, and, and so they get a chance to really, really, really um, work with a bunch of science all throughout the summer, which basically means digging a lot of holes, <laughs> basically until you fall down, because they work people pretty hard, and then we have to bring out the heavy equipment, because they just can't get those darn students to dig down to the feet, no matter how often I ask them. So we brought out, um, you know, like, this is the type of equipment you would use to dig a well, but in this case, where we want to keep all the sediment. And so these are um, six inch metal casings and they have in them undisturbed sediments. And so we have a near continuous record going down over 60 meters of these six inch tubes. I have hundreds of these tubes. And they were all carefully split. Um, they were a machine shop, we built a whole bunch of tools. So they were all, this is just absolutely undisturbed, beautiful records for time. Um, and now they're all archived. So we've used a bunch of them. They're all split in half. At least a quarter of every single core will be kept in perp perpetuity for uh, people to be able to look at and use the data. So here's some examples of what we're seeing. Um, let's see, play better from here. This is right here, is again from the very bottom of the core. These are the old paleo soils below the landslide. So this probably looks like if you've ever dug a pit on your property, this looks very familiar, okay? This, however, and these, these are, so this is before you had the lake. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Oh, I'm not trying to say it better to take someone's eye out. Um, <laughs> I'm 
popular hands thing. These are the lake sediments. So you can see here these uh, the different layers. This is every year. You can see the organic layer and then the mineral layer. We actually have ash in the core, both Mount Mazama, and then we have from about 37,000 years ago when Mount St. Helens first began to burp. And so we're trying to figure out which of the first series of burps from Mount St. Helens that core, that ash is. So it, there's a researcher in New Zealand who's looking at that now. And this again is that, this is the, a, the one part of the tree that's being passed around from 207 feet down. So this is the tree on the original valley floor, the landslide came down on top of. And again, that looks like a tree you would just find, you know, on your property somewhere, right? So there's, there's that, that age curve, the conceptual model of it. Here's the real one. Here's the real data. So these are, every one of these squares or circles is a carbon-14 date. So 50,000 years ago is the non-glacial. Then there's a transition period from 28 to 26,000 years. And then you're in the glacial up to 20,000 years. There's a, so, so these are, I know what the depth is, I know what the age is, and I can plot this curve, right? And so you can see here that um, here's this pretty gentle slope, relatively gentle slope, right? And then I know from the power that there's a two to four degree temperature drop. That's when we're diving into the glacial, right? And then the next part is the glacial, and this, something's happening here. Okay, this is our first hint that something is different during the glacial compared to before. These are all coarse blue-gray anaerobic sands. This right here is 15 meters of sediment, and they are all 23,000 years. And what that tells me as a geologist looking at that is the mountain was absolutely just falling apart. Okay, this, this is called it's a sediment accumulation rate, right, in the lake it's four times faster during the glacial than it was before. So crazy, crazy different change. I mean, it takes a really significant shift to have that much of an impact on bedrock to soil production and transport. You know, just a little like watershed. It's a tiny little watershed, right? And this isn't landslides, because you can see if you have landslides coming in, you know, with the same periodicity that you would expect to happen um, but this is just suddenly the mountains are falling apart. So here's where your part comes in. I've got a question for you. Okay? So if you could go back in time and you were standing right where you are now, but it just happens to be 21,000 years ago, okay? So you might be wearing a down carpet because we're in the middle of the glacier. Okay? How cold was it? I've got a couple hints for you. Okay? It was during the glacial. But there were no glaciers in the coast range during the last glacial, right? So here's the ice sheet. And um, as most of you probably know, the extent of the ice sheet in the Pacific Northwest is the Puget, is, um, Puget Sound, right? That's the glacial, old glacial trough. And here we are down here. And here's another thing for you. The mean annual temperature today, so January through December, right, that temperature curve is about 11 degrees C or 52 degrees, 53 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? So I've got an Excel spreadsheet chart, chart, ready to go, and I'm going to take guesses for people. Now, I'm not going to write your name down, so you, you, don't, you can be as free as you want on this, So okay? are we doing solstice June this time of year? No, the mean, average mean year? annual, so the average mean temperature over the year. So, so the Indian Fahrenheit. Give us the mean annual again. 54 degrees present day. And this is during? 21,000 years ago. During? The, the height of the glacier. The height of the glacier. Yeah, but it's not glaciated. 42. Okay, go. So I like someone who's ready to go. 60. 60? One. Ah, so it's a troublemaker in every class. Same as today. 52. Same as today, 54, okay? 48. Okay? Uh, 32. Okay? Come on. 52. 58. 52, 38. 50. 38, okay. 51. Okay. I'm glad you guys aren't giving me decimals. Good? Should we average this and see what the group consensus is? Is everyone good with this meaning consensus? Okay. Okay. You're willing to take, like, if you disagree with, you know. Okay. So, I mean, there's a watershed console, so I'm not sure what the rules are on this consensus. 
Yeah. Then after you thumbs up or thumbs down or thumbs okay, sideways. Okay, well. Sideways, <laughs> right? Exactly. Call them sideways. Let's see. It's hard to do this when you're sitting in front of people. Is equal to average. How am I doing on time? Is you're doing great. You okay. got it. You've got another. Seven minutes of presenting plus forty-seven points. Oh, okay. <laughs> so both, both we can translate that into uh, let's say, put that in the wrong place. We can also translate that into Celsius, but you're not that far off from the other one, so um, it's not going to change that much. I cannot do Celsius. I'll forget it. Okay, we'll just go with forty-seven point four. Anyone who can do Celsius in their head, is this time or minus thirty-two times five divided by nine? So now we've got that. Okay, so I'll save that. You guys will be saved in perpetuity. Okay, and let's see slideshow. From, ah. from this slide, yeah. From, from current slides. From current slides. Okay. Yeah, okay. okay, so. You guys were not that far off, right? 47.44444. Okay, so here's, I want to walk you through a couple of things. So I, I've asked this exact same question several times. Um, I was at a meeting of a bunch of esteemed Oregon scientists, and they went and asked them. So the 17 or esteemed Oregon scientists, their answer, you guys are pretty darn close. You were like right there with the esteemed Oregon wow. scientists. <laughs> yeah. Really? So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Off by point two degrees, you know, that was me. Uh, no, no, but no, but they, I mean, that was pretty yeah. equal to what you guys came up with. Then I went and asked um, a whole other group. I went, I was out at, um, Kelly invited me out to the Triangle Lake Charter School. So this is the science, we did another crowdsourcing there from the science classes, and I asked them what they thought. And of course, they're students, so they think much broader than the esteemed scientists, right? Um, so they came up with negative 9 degrees, or 15 degrees Fahrenheit. So here's what the scientists and you guys came up with, right? I got bad news for you. <laughs> You're all really wrong. <laughs> okay. I put they were very wrong, I was assuming, but, but okay, and I'm going to tell you how I came up with this number, but trust me when I say that 21,000 years ago, if you were standing at this spot, of course it would have been a lake, so you might have had to be floating on something, but it was about zero degrees Celsius. It was really cold. It was much colder than people. And what's so funny is the paleontologists knew this. All the paleocologists who have been working in Little Lake, all their um, journals <coughs> say this. But only paleocologists were really reading and thinking about it. So, um, you know, there have been people who have been doing cores in Little Lake for a long time because it's such a fabulous research site. So I, these numbers are based on, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the global circulation, general circulation models that I've been working with, and the, the trees. The macrofossils don't lie, right? I mean, if you've got a uh, Douglas fir, it lives in a specific temperature range. And if you've got a red leaf maple, it lives in a specific temperature range. Well, 21,000 years ago, we've got subalpine fir and Sitka spruce in that core. And those are species that exist in Alaska today. Okay? And so the trees didn't change what temperature range they could survive in. But the temperature should change here. So, um, and so now, now here comes the really, really, really sciencey part. But I'm not going to go into a lot of details on this. You can come ask me questions later, and we can draw graphs and plots, and I can try to reconstruct the equations, and then I'll cry. But so, remember that curve, that depth age plot that I showed you, with that four times increase in sediment accumulation rate? Here's what we think was going on. You had a forest, um, a cedar pine forest, um, during the glacial interval. When, when it was cold, the, the non-glacial, when it was cold, getting colder. By the time you got here into the glacial, we were in frost cracking territory. So frost cracking is what you might think of as freeze thaw, but I'm here to tell you, don't think of freeze thaw anymore. It's an outdated notion in the real world. So. Freeze thaw, you know, the thing we all know is that 
Water expands by 9% when it's frozen compared to when it's liquid. So if you put a jar in the freezer but with glass and you don't have enough air space, right, you come back to a broken glass jar. But in nature, if you're outside, if you're in rock, rock is pretty porous. So it's not a closed container. And so ice can actually move. There's, it's not stuck in a closed container like it is in your freezer. So, but there is a mechanism that breaks apart rock, and it's called frost packing or ice segregation. And it's a little more complex than um, just volumetric expansion. So I'm just going to run through it really briefly. Yeah. Five. Oh, oh, five. Okay. I've been waiting to me. <laughs> so, um, okay, so frost packing basically varies with the temperature gradient, and the water migrates <laughs> towards the ice front in cracks. And there it accretes and little ice nodules build, and that pressure is what actually breaks the rock apart. And the more water, you, faster you can deliver water, the faster you can break apart rock. There's an optimal temperature range for this to happen. If it's too cold, the water is all sticky and doesn't move. This is at the grain interface. And the frost pack intensity actually depends upon the shape of your temperature curve. So, um, understanding how cold it was in January and how warm it was in July and August matters a lot. If you're going to think about not only what are the mechanisms that break apart mountain, but how efficient are they. So that's why we moved into working with um, paleoclimate models. And so we're using general circulation models, which are what, you know, when you think about climate change and the models that like the IPPCCC did. Um, they also have a whole series of models that they've back um, calculated. So looking at how the land mass and the ice mass and the water all work together. So we can use the macrofossils to basically constrain the GCMs. So Little Lake is actually um, having, it's becoming very important for people who do really large scale climate modeling because there's very few sites like this on the West Coast where you have a record that goes back through time. Back that yeah, because you know we're in a fast eroding area. There's just not places where the sediment hangs around, mm -hmm. and to have this really quiet lake basin um, is just uh, you know that's that's what makes it so amazing and so unusual. So Little Lake actually tells us which of the GCMs that are out there um, are right for the West Coast, which is pretty cool, you know, to have it go the opposite way. And so one of the really big implications, and I alluded to this earlier when I was saying how this has implications not just for Little Lake, but for much bigger than that. So you all, you know, when you thought about, well, it's not glaciated, what could the temperature be? Maybe it's a little colder. You're not the first people to do that. It's actually really, really common even in the scientific community when we think non-glaciated, we don't think about the fact that you could still have a totally different type of world. And so we've been modeling frost packing intensity or how much ice was there across Oregon. So this is, you know, there's California, here's Washington. This is actually the influence of the ice sheet. And here, all these places 21,000 years ago are where there was no longer biology that was doing the work. It was ice that was breaking apart mountains and likely having those same type of influences that you see in that sediment um, accumulation curve that I showed you, where it's a whole different world. And this matters then, you can start to think about it mattering, not just in Oregon, I mean, I'm Oregon-centric, right? But everywhere in the soil mantle landscape where you're below the ice sheet, where we've always thought of the world as non-glaciated, it turns out that during the last glacial, that the world was really, really different. And Little Lake is like the place that's leading us there. So the is science. Is the star Little Lake? I'm sorry? Is the star on that Little Lake? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, 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 the star is Little Lake. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah. So Little Lake is like in a sweet spot for breaking rock apart. And so mm -hmm. I'll go really fast because I'm running out of time. So I talked a little bit about this last time. Um, the other side of the story, so that's the big picture. And so we've been working on the models for that, and um, that work is like finishing up essentially. You know, describing, using Little Lake, using the fossils that are here to understand, and using that sediment 
record to understand that things were really, really different, not just here, but likely in a broad swath of land below the ice sheet. Okay. The other part of this is then we're thinking about going back to Little Lake and thinking about all these mechanisms and how when you change from uh, maybe a permafrost setting to the forests of today, what does that mean mechanically for how rocks break apart? Okay. So I'm going to show you some super, super preliminary results. You're about the first to see them. So they're really, really preliminary, but we've been measuring erosion rates in the watershed. So this is a plot going back in time. These little things here are periods when, remember I told you how it gets cold and you dive into the glacial? Well, there's periods even in the non-glacial when it gets really cold, OK? And so you wiggle when it gets really cold and it kind of goes back to the trend that it's on. What you've got here is, um, this is the erosion rates average. And there's a whole bunch of these with these huge error bars as to the processing method where we're processing stuff right now. So, so this is a sheet and rail erosion rate? The surface no, rate? this is this is no. the bedrock. This is the rate that you are basically converting bedrock into soil. Oh, okay. So this is well, these are erosion rates over thousand year time frames. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you about the method um, later on. It's really but cool. Okay, it has to do with startups. Yeah. Huh? It's a, a lower, you know, a lowering below, rate. Below the yeah. soil. Right. And see, what you can where do the is bedrock's being broken up. As the lowering rate of the land. Okay. Okay. So, as of course, the speed uplift at the same time. But it's the rate that the land is lowering. <laughs> I know, geology. It's happening everywhere. It's moving everywhere. It's moving everywhere. But there's a couple things going on, and, and this is what we're trying to sort out. I'll be back next year to tell you about this. But essentially, the long, the average erosion rate during the glacial is uh, 0.16 millimeters a year. If you get around it, it's 0.2 millimeters a year. Okay, and the average this right here, this is a whole bunch of present day erosion rates from streams, um, oh, a couple tributaries to Little Lake, um, uh, tributaries to the Umpqua, other tributaries to the Sayus Law. And it plots out where the Oregon Coast Range erosion rates always plot out, which is 0.1 millimeter a year. You guys might have seen that, used that in some of your watershed reports. And this is, this, this is the rate that you see both in creeks, if you're looking at sediment yield, just a suspended sediment, and it's also what we come up with everywhere in the Coast Range for longer term erosion rates. So the Duffer Forest, um, compared to the glacial, the glacial was um, you know, one and a half to two times the erosion rate. And what that basically means is ice wins. You know, I, I came into this thinking that biology was going to win. The trees were what was really good, making things fall apart. We didn't expect it to really be falling apart in the soil mantle non-glaciated landscape. But these erosion rates basically suggest that the mountains were falling apart about two times as fast. Uh, during the glacial as they are today, and that, um, you know, there, was, there were no glaciers, but there might have been permafrost here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the next time you go to Alaska, you're like, oh yeah, if I was back here 21,000 years ago, this would be familiar. Um, and, you know, the, I was really surprised to find out that biology has played less, a less important role, because um, I'm a big fan of the trees. So. Um, yeah, and that's it. There's, the, there's some of the people who have been out working out here for a while. I don't think any questions. Yeah. Can you kind of envision what it might have been 16,000 years ago? Yeah, so it would, still, it would have still been, um, so the glacial went from 26,000 years to 13,000 years ago. So still would have been okay. falling apart. So one of the interesting things though, um, you might have noticed that that erosion that I that the sediment the depth age model is like really beautiful, right? I mean it's a line like this and a line like this. I mean look at the erosion rate, it's like woo, woo, woo. And so I think there was some stuff going on with um, we had um, you had a period where you had a whole bunch of sediment and rock that was already primed because you have tree roots that break up the rock, right? So it's ready to go. And then when frost packing came along, the trees were gone. So the soil is able to take off like a freight train, right? It just as these giant salt fluxion lobes, which is why you suddenly get that huge influx in the lake. 
But if you strip away everything that's ready to go, then it takes some time to ramp up again. So 16,000 years ago, I think there probably wasn't very much soil in the watershed. That it was probably thinner than it was today. But we're, that's the stuff we're going to be working on the next year. How cold does it have to be to get glaciers? Um, that was my question. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, no, yeah, so to, to get glaciers it had to, below zero, and the main thing is, is that you have to have I mean, enough snow. Centigrade. Below zero centigrade, yeah. yeah. You have to have enough snow that stays from year to year. So the main thing is it has to be cold in the summer. See, that's what makes the glacier stay around, is that it doesn't melt away. And then you have more snow that lands on top of it. And so, and I don't know actually, but I think it's that you basically stay, you know, so close, close to the year, you're below and zero. And it's quite a ways before the, you get to the glaciers. Why yeah. I don't think it would be that cold. Anyway. Right, so the whole thing about this frost cracking is it doesn't have to be cold enough in glaciers. It's actually this a really cool, cool, cool physical mm -hmm. process. Um, and you know you've seen you guys have all seen a version of it. It's the same process when you go out on a really cold um, winter morning, and you have ice needles. Oh yeah, it's the, that actually forms the exact same way. And if you when you see that stuff, it's not breaking things apart, but it mm -hmm. will lift up. You know, like bark and little pieces of dirt. Right, you can see those just resting on there. So that ice that co comes from a temperature gradient. So you that's because you have the warm soil on the top and it's colder at the bottom. And so you have that same temperature gradient that gets set up. And so it forms these ice lenses and they push, they're, they're strong enough to push up the stuff that's on top of it. What, what were the precipitation levels here during the last glacier? They were less than they are now. They were less than But they were still a fair amount of water. And I don't remember the numbers. Okay, but, yeah. but it was less than they are now. Yeah, less, le it was drier than it is now. Okay. Yeah. One last question, or I, okay, two questions, <laughs> Greg, I see, both Je uh, sorry, Jess, yeah, yeah, okay, good. You've been named Jess. I, I know, and I can't see, and I talked to you many times, sorry. All right, um, so I was just wondering kind of what your work shows maybe currently, what's going on currently, or maybe not going on that might have implications for the future. <coughs> I think the main thing in terms of what I'm doing as implications for the future is, uh, and I tend to work at really long time <laughs> scales, but you know, even for creeks, when, when you go out and you think about what's the sediment that's coming down, and you understand that even 12,000 years ago, it was that things were behaving differently, and in certain landscapes, not, not in most of the coast range, because it's so small that the transport time for things to move out is pretty fast. But I, there's a lot of landscapes where the present day, the Holocene, is just a really thin skin on what happened for a much longer time. And so people often, most a lot of their studies are on, think about present day processes and they attribute everything that's happening to present day processes. And I think People th have thought it considered this for a long time for glaciers, and I think this the, this whole bit about there being frost packing and this whole different process happening at the amount of land that likely happened, I mean, that's what the climate models are showing us, is really big. And so it means people have to rethink when you think about you know present day processes, how much of that is present day versus from before. <clears throat> the lake core picture, they uh, seem to have no bioturbation. Could you mention yeah. why that would be so? Um, I think it was a really cold lake. Okay. So, I mean, that's my guess. But yes, there's very, so I only, I of course showed you the prettiest things. But there's actually surprisingly little bioturbation. And if anybody's ever at the University of Oregon, I'm going to have to have advanced notice because, you know, I'm usually crazy running around. But I love showing the core. We've got it in coolers. I am happy to pull it out and have you guys see them in all their glory <laughs> rather than in just these little <coughs> six inch sections on that thing. But yeah, that's a really good question. There's actually very, very little bioturbation in the core. Thank cool. you, Joe. Thanks, guys. Thank you.